Welcome to the demonstration part of the data analysis lecture, where I am going to show you how to just analyze a couple of data sets in a package uh, or software package called R. And as I said, R is an open source and free software, very popular. It is available on all platforms. I am not going to show you how to install R. You can just go to the website, download R. And for R, there is a very nice graphical user interface, GUI called the R Studio and I strongly recommend you download that and install. All of that should be done fairly easily. I have done that on my computer. Uh, so if you have uh, a computer handy, you may want to pause this video, install and then come back and then carry on with the instructions that I, uh, that I go through in this lecture. So I have R Studio installed. Of course, before installing R Studio, I have installed R as well and I am going to open this R Studio interface. This is how the interface should look like. Of course, uh, it can look a bit different on depending on how you configure it. The purpose of this lecture is not to show you what R is about and so on. Uh, that's There are many number of tutorials available on the web for that purpose. The purpose is to just show you uh, what careful data analysis is about just with a, a couple of uh, data sets. Now, as I had mentioned during my lecture, the R package comes with it a lot of data sets that the user can play around with. That is one of the nice features of R. Now, uh, to know what data sets are available, one could use the syntax in R. The question mark syntax in R basically brings up help. And the nice thing about R Studio is it completes the keyword or whatever you are typing if it is a part of the R system and data sets is a package in R and therefore as I typed data sets you can see it is trying to complete that for me and it is also saying that it is a package. So what I am typing therefore is right uh, what I am looking for it makes sense. So let us uh, ask for help on data sets and it says R data sets is a package. To know what data sets are available in R, go to the index at the bottom here and that brings up the uh, documentation for the package data set. Uh, I have the version 3.2.1 and they are listed in alphabetical order. Of course, it is impossible for me to go over all these data sets. Let us look at this particular uh, data set called Beavers. But before I do that, I want to draw your attention to this ANSCOM uh, data set that we talked about in the lecture. If you click on the ANSCOM data set, it gives you a description of the data set. In fact, we can load that to begin with. To load a data set that is that, that comes with the R package, uh, all you have to do is type data and then uh, type the name of the data set. And once again, R Studio shows the list of the uh, completions that one can have. And ANSCOM is the one that I am looking for and I choose that. And once I do that, as you can see on the top right, ANSCOM data set has been loaded. Uh, do not worry about the promise part, it is just uh, not exactly loaded. The moment you talk about ANSCOM uh, or in the sense in the command prompt, the moment you start typing the name of the data set, it shows you the true uh, nature of the data, whether it is a time series data or a regular data and so on. It shows that it is a data frame, a data frame in R is nothing like a but a matrix of data but with the columns labeled and the labels of uh, ANSCOM or any other data frame can be easily found. For example, we could ask what are the labels for ANSCOM data set, sorry. This is the syntax. So these are the labels that go with the columns. The ANSCOM data set has 8 columns. Remember we had 4 pairs, 4 x's and 4 y's and one could plot the x1 versus y1 or x2, y2 and regenerate the plots that I showed you in the lecture. For example, if I would, if I want to plot the uh, ANSCOM uh, x1, y1 pair, then I could, I am just recalling the commands that I have in my history and that is a nice feature of R Studio. So here I am plotting x1, uh, sorry, y1 versus x1 of the ANSCOM data set and the syntax here tells me PCH equals 19. 
that is these are all optional syntaxes. If I omit those then it will just simply produce a scatter plot, but I do not, I, I want something more, I want solid circles that are colored red. So, PCH19 is basically telling which character it should use for plotting the markers and that and the color tells the plot to use a red color. So, if I do this then it produces as you see on the right bottom screen, I have here uh, the y1 versus x1 as you can see on the y and x axis labels. You can also of course enhance and decorate these plots by providing x, y labels, I am not going to go into that. But main thing that you should observe is this plot is exactly identical to what you have seen in the lecture. And I welcome you to reproduce the other plots that I have uh, shown you in the lecture. And of course, what one could ask for is <coughs> the summary statistics. Summary statistics are nothing but mean, median and so on. But uh, we, yeah, so we could ask for the summary statistics for the ANSCOM data set. The nice thing about this summary command in R is that uh, for a data frame it looks through every column and reports the mean, uh, minimum, maximum, median and so on. So, particular attention that I want to draw uh, <coughs> your attention to is the mean. So, mean of uh, x1, x2, y2 or if you can look at mean of y1 and mean of y2 and y3, y4 are identical. It's maybe mean of y3 is just differing by one third decimal, but they all have the same average. In fact, you can also check if they have the same uh, correlation that is x1 and y1 have the same correlation, x2 and y2 have the same correlation and so on. So, how do you compute uh, correlation? Uh, let us say that we want to compute the correlation between x1 and y1 of the ANSCOM data set. This dollar operator is uh, an operator in R which allows you to access the columns of a data frame. Data frame is different from matrix, but it looks like a matrix. But the dollar operator applies to data frames and lists and so on. So, this is the correlation between x1 and y1. Let us see if they have the same x2 and y2 have the same correlation. So, so, exactly the same correlation. So, every pair in the ANSCOM data set has the same correlation despite looking strikingly different. Now, let us move on to the next data set that I want to uh, show you. In fact, the nice thing about R is that it comes, although it comes with a few install uh, packages by default, one can go to the R website and look for uh, packages of interest from the thousands of user contributed packages meant for additional purposes. And there are many, many such packages, play around with them. And the other nice thing is each package comes with a data set that you can test the routines in that package. Right? Again, uh, if you go to the R tutorial, you can realize how to do that. So, let us load another <coughs> package called Beavers and to know what this Beavers data set is about, we will go back to the help and pick the uh, Beavers package. It says it is a body temperature series of two beavers. Beavers are this uh, huge rodents that are found in uh, North America and so on. And they are very well known for building dams, small dams and walls and, and so on. So, they, they are uh, kind of a weaver in that sense. So, this beavers uh, has two data sets in it, beaver 1 and beaver 2 corresponding to the body temperature of two different beavers and we can we will look at the first data set the beaver 1 it has about 114 data points in it collected at 10 minute intervals using a technique called telemetry and there is more information on this in the documentation. So, to load the beavers data set as usual type data beavers and as you can see in the environment here the workspace beaver 1 and beaver 2 have been loaded once again they the type of data will be shown the moment you access the uh, beaver 1. So, for example, if I want to know what uh, type it is, just type start typing the name and R studio will show you that it is a data frame as well. 
So, how many columns uh, does the data frame B11 have? It has four columns. And to know what are the names of those, once again, we type, uh, we uh, look at the attributes or the names, sorry, of the columns. And it shows that the first two columns give me the day and time at which this record measurements were taken. And the third one is a temperature that is of interest to us. Let us plot the temperature. So, we say plot B were 1 dollar temperature. And when I do this, it produces a scatter plot, but I want ideally also a line plot. And I can ask for a line plot if I want. And then this is the line plot. I can also ask for both lines and points and so on, the story is endless. But this is how the temperature series looks like over two days of recording. Now, as you can see, the temperature hovers around uh, 36, 37 and so on, and there is some variability to it. Now, the question is, should I ask whether this data comes out of a deterministic or a stochastic process? This is univariate series. Uh, suppose I want to predict what will be the temperature of the beaver the following day, I want to build a model. Should I treat this as a deterministic process? Now, <clears throat> I can treat this as a deterministic process if I see at least from a visual analysis that a mathematical function can explain this nicely. Now, of course, I can always fit a polynomial of 113th degree to explain the data perfectly, but unfortunately, the 113th degree polynomial will fail miserably in predicting the next point. That also is an indication of lack of determinism in the data. And also I do not have any other factors that affect the beaver's temperature to help me predict this. So, it may be a wise thing to assume that this uh, temperature series is stochastic. But on the other hand, I also find some trends and we will talk about it in the next and the final data set that we will take up. So, for now, we can treat this data set to be stochastic and ask for mean of beaver. For example, I can ask what is the mean of B, uh, sorry, beaver 1 dollar temperature. <coughs> All right, we can do that. And uh, that is the average. We can also ask for the standard deviation. You can recall the previous commands uh, or the history in the history by using the up and down arrows. And this is the standard deviation and so on. Now, what we want to do is also compare the means. That is, suppose my hypothesis is that these two beavers have the same average temperature, right? <coughs> Definitely the temperature observations that I have are, fall, are just one of the many possible readings that I could have obtained. So, I am imagining that there is a population of readings for beaver 1 and population of readings for beaver 2 that, and I am assuming that both these populations have same averages and let us say I want to test that. <coughs> Sorry. Now, statistically that is a hypothesis test. So, if mu 1 is a true mean for beaver 1 and mu 2 is a true mean for beaver 2. I am here conducting a hypothesis test that mu 1 equals mu 2 or mu 1 minus mu 2 is 0. Now, we are not going to go into the theory, but let me quickly tell you the routine or the command that helps you compare averages of two different populations and that is the, the t dot test command, which uh, is also known as a student's t test. The t refers to the distribution of the statistic that we shall use to carry out the hypothesis test. Remember, statistic is some mathematical function of the data. So, what is done at least uh, theoretically just to give you an idea is that sample means of both the B11 and B12 series are computed and statistically we look at the distance you can say so crudely between the sample means you can uh, in the fact in, in presence of the fact that they have come from two different populations. <clears throat> what is the difference between them? I am hypothesizing that the means are the same. Then what is the difference? The difference is in the variability, in the variances. That is they come out of different spreads. But to know that for example, whether my assumption that different variabilities hold good, 
we can look at the histogram and look at the spread also. So, let us look at the histogram of beaver 1 which gives me an idea of the distribution of the data. Sorry. So, <clears throat> the on the right, now on the plot you see the histogram of data it is beaver 1 uh, his temperature histogram so indicating some kind of a Gaussian distribution with the mean uh, being the value that we have calculated here. What about beaver 2 does it look like a Gaussian distribution or some other distribution? <clears throat> now, it does not look exactly like a Gaussian I mean not even uh, so close, but what we can see strikingly is that the variability. So, if I look at the variance of beaver 2 and variance versus variance of beaver 1, the variabilities uh, these are sample variabilities that is these have been computed from data they are quite different from each other. So, <clears throat> there is some justification to the assumption that we are making that this uh, the temperature readings of these two beavers have come from different variability. In other words, the variability of temperature in both these beavers are quite different from each other. And it is possible even among human beings temperatures can vary quite significantly, but the means can be the same. So, we can now test the hypothesis <coughs> and uh, to know the syntax of any routine for example, I can press the tab and it tells me what are the default ones. I have to supply the first series and then supply the second series and then also there are other options that you want what is the alternative hypothesis. Whenever I am testing an hypothesis of any null hypothesis there is an alternative hypothesis that I have to specify. Here I the alternative hypothesis is that the means are different from each other. In, in other situations I may test the mean of beaver 1 or the true average of a temperature of beaver 1 is greater than that of beaver 2 and so on, but we are not interested in that here. So, the default alternative if you look up the t test uh, t dot test uh, see, documentation it says gives you the default values which is uh, for the alternative one it says they are not different and <clears throat> there are many other options for example, variance being equal am I assuming the variability to be equal no and that is a default option as well it says false. So, I do not have to do anything with that and there are a few other options which I am not going to explain now it requires a bit of theory, but let us do this and let us see what the t dot test uh, tell, tells me. It reports a bunch of things, but what is of importance is this p value all right and of course, it gives you the means of x and y. When you look at the sample means they look pretty close I mean of course, in the sense you, you may say no I may say yes and that is the reason why we are performing a statistical analysis, but <clears throat> the statistical analysis with its very very low p value is indicating that the hypothesis null hypothesis that the means are equal does not hold good it has to be rejected. Whenever the p value is low the null hypothesis must go. So, that is a uh, nice phrase that you will find in Ognayake's book as well. It is also telling you the alternative hypothesis against which the null hypothesis has been tested and uh, it, it also gives you the 95 percent confidence interval. This is 95 percent confidence interval is on something what is that? It is on the difference in the means. So, what it is uh, uh, testing is that the means are not different from each other that is a null hypothesis. And if you turn to statistics books they will tell you that a hypothesis test of the form mu 1 minus mu 2 equals 0 can be also conducted by looking at the confidence interval for the difference in means. So, the confidence interval for the difference in means is reported here and it does not include the postulated value which is 0. If the confidence interval had included the <coughs> postulated value for the difference in true means which is 0, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence in the data to reject the null hypothesis. In this case, we have sufficient evidence in the data to come to a conclusion that the temperature average temperature of beaver 1 and average temperature of beaver 2 are different from each other. And we have done this despite the fact that 
the readings in Beaver 1 and Beaver 2 are of different sizes. Beaver 1 has 114 data points, Beaver 2 has 100 data points. How do I know that? I can ask for the length or I can look up the help and you can see there are 100 <coughs> data points, whereas we had 114 data points. So, the theory allows you to collect different sample sizes, <coughs> but the question is whether this test itself is has been conducted correctly theoretically. Does it satisfy theoretical assumptions? Probably not because this T test actually assumes that both the samples have come from Gaussian distributions. <coughs> and we have seen that the Beaver 2 temperature series is not really conforming to the Gaussian distribution, but maybe had we collected larger and larger samples, then the assumptions might have been met more strictly. All right? So, the point to keep in mind is not, <coughs> not just reporting the analysis, but also the assumptions that we have made and whether the data has met those assumptions. The final thing that I want to show you is another series which is the carbon dioxide emissions in a certain region during a certain period. Again, I welcome you to look up the help on this data set. Just want to show you the data set and <coughs> here uh, I have loaded the carbon dioxide data set and we shall plot this uh, series. <coughs> and you can see in this series there is a trend, the x axis is time, the year uh, in which it was the carbon dioxide emission was collected. There is a linear trend or probably a slightly parabolic trend, we do not know. Uh, but vividly there are two things, a linear trend and then there is an oscillatory nature to it. Now, once again the question, should I treat this as a deterministic uh, process or a stochastic process? On the face of it, it appears deterministic because it is so dominant. The, there is a mathematical function that I can fit to explain the trend. I can also explain the oscillations using sinusoids. I can determine the frequency. How do I determine the frequency? By looking at the periodogram or the power spectral density. You can uh, fit a linear trend. I will show you how to fit linear trends when we go to the lecture on modeling skills. Basically, it is a matter of regression. But this <coughs> shows you that there is a possibility you will, uh, that you can think of series as deterministic. However, once you have removed the deterministic part, you should ask if there is anything left in the series to be explained. And if that has some irregularity, some stochastic nature to it, then you come to the conclusion that this series is a mix of deterministic and stochastic here, uh, 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 stochastic process. Here the determinism is purely as a function of time. In many processes, the deterministic nature can come about by a certain cause that you already know. Right? In the reactor temperature example that we discussed, if I give you the coolant flow and the reactor temperature series, using the coolant flow, you can explain the variations in the coolant uh, in the reactor temperature significantly. Yet, there will be something left in the temperature that you may not be able to explain using the coolant flow, which will be due to the sensor noise. There you have a mix of deterministic and stochastic process. We are not talking about linear or nonlinear here. Anyway, so hopefully, I have introduced to you with uh, through these examples, first of all the great uh, free open source software package called R, because some of the students I have seen on the forum have requested for introduction to an exposure to some programming language. But what is needed in data analysis is not necessarily programming language, but a nice software tool that conforms to the theory and R has been written by many of the uh, pioneers in the a world of statistical data analysis. Therefore, there is more credibility to it and there is a nice user forum. You can ask any questions and it is continuously developed. R studio is a fantastic uh, piece of GUI for R. So, enjoy and uh, yeah, write to us if you have any questions. Hopefully, you enjoy the lecture. Thank you.